Today we're in chapter 21. We're going to pick up at verse 15 here in 2 Samuel. Then we're going to move into chapter 22 and uh, do uh, both of those chapters, concluding chapter 21 and, and giving uh, chapter 22 uh, in full. And so let's begin reading together here in uh, chapter 21 at verse 15. And I'll read verses 15 through 22. Then we'll get into our study. Beginning at verse 15, when the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines. And David grew faint. Then Ishbi Benab, who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, which is seven and a half pounds, who was bearing a new sword or an innovative weapon, thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. I'll stop there. We'll read the rest as we continue on. But what we have here is we have verses in uh, chapter 21, verses uh, 15 through 22, verses that, that summarize David's battles against his enemies. Enemies here that are referred to as the Philistines. And so what we have here in these verses, verses 15 through 22, is really a, an account of the defeat of four giants at the hands of the men of David. And so what this does in reality as we look at verses 15 through 22 is it sets the tone for us as we enter into chapter 20, 22 because in, in chapter uh, 21, verses uh, 15 through 22, we have a summarization of, of David's battles and defeat of the Philistines. And then right into chapter 22, when you begin at verse 1, you see David composing and singing a song to the Lord, a song of, of, uh, of praise. And so what you have is you have deliverance that results in praise. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. David and his army have been fighting against the Philistines. And, and during the battle, even as we just saw a moment ago, David has grown tired. David has grown older. And so his strength and his stamina are now failing. And, and during this combat... Notice with me, he grew tired and his strength began to fail. Now, that would have been difficult for David because David is a warrior and he's a man who was not expecting to have, have his strength and his stamina fail in battle. He simply wasn't expecting that. David had a, a, a fighter's spirit, a warrior's spirit. So he's not used to growing tired in battle. That by itself would have humbled him tremendously. Now, obviously... That's just what happens as you grow older. There's just nothing like growing older to discover humility. David was a young man when he defeated Goliath. David was a tried and proven warrior through his adult life. And now David is growing to the point where people have to rescue him. That has to bring within him a sense of humility because he was a combat veteran and he's not used to to this, but that's the way that it is, isn't it? I, in in First Peter chapter one verse twenty-four, the apostle said, "All flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away." You see, you can spend a lifetime working out, developing strength, but eventually your strength is going to fail. You grow older, and you grow weaker. That's just the way it is. It's good to maintain your strength. It's good to maintain your health because it's something that can be profitable in this lifetime. God gives you health. You can use it for his glory. But we have to have the humility to realize that uh, you're not going to remain strong forever. Eventually, that strength that you used to take pride in and rely on, eventually it does fade. And as a young man, I was thinking this before this service, when I was a young man, it, you know, I was, I was one of these guys that athletics came fairly easily to me. When I went into the military, as part of my uh, five out of seven days, I would run. I would run three miles a day. Uh, I used to do 300 sit-ups, consecutive sit-ups a night in less than five minutes every day. Uh, lifted weights, played handball. You name it, that's what I did. I enjoyed it. I was part of a part of a, a division, the 82nd Airborne Division. We were known for being able to run and all of that, and that's what I did. I enjoyed it. It was very easy to do. I, I continued doing that for a long time. At the age of 40, I was still benching 300 pounds. It wasn't any big thing. It's just the way it was, because you work out, 
You can stay strong. You don't realize that you're growing older. When Marie gave birth to Corinne, our firstborn, we lived in a little apartment, and uh, Marie, because she had given birth, couldn't walk up the stairs, and I used to pick her up and carry her up the stairs every day and bring her down the stairs. Now she picks me up and carries me up the stairs. I mean, you get older, and when you get older, you get weaker. That's just the way it is. It's the way of the flesh. That's the way of the world. It just happens. And so what you used to rely on in the past, you can no longer rely on in, in the future. It just doesn't work that way. You may have been strong and you may have been fast and you may have had all of those attributes. It might have been just so easy for you. David was that way. David sees Goliath, the giant, nine foot, nine inches tall, huge. Doesn't even think for a moment, just enters into battle. Because David was a warrior, but now David's growing older. Because that's the way of all flesh. That's how it works. You can work out all day long, every day, but eventually you just get older and tired. Man, we used to, we used to brag about our, our chest. It's in 40, 44-inch chest. Now that's our waist. <laughs> Gravity hits. There used to be a saying, she has an hourglass shape. Well, the sand does shift, ladies. <laughs> it goes to the bottom of that glass. <laughs> that's what happens. I mean, that's life. That's, that's the way it is. And so the Apostle Paul was speaking one time in, in, in 1 Timothy, and, and he said this in chapter 4, verse 8. He said, Bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. The one thing that you benefit from when it's aging, it's aging in the Lord. Because the older you get in Jesus, the more experience you have with God that you can give to the younger people. There's so many who want to remain young forever, but they're failing to realize that's not possible, not in the flesh. But as you're growing older in the things of God, then you begin to understand that though physical exercise is good because it keeps your heart strong and you're able to do the things that are necessary to be able to be used by God, spiritual exercise, being in the Word of God, being in prayer, being in fellowship, sharing your faith. Those are the kinds of things that make you stronger. And as you're getting older, you're becoming in the Lord wiser and, and more usable for the King. Because a 25-year-old has all that energy but little experience. A 65-year-old may not have that energy but has a tremendous amount of experience and wisdom in the Lord. So rather than us trying to be profitable in the sense of keeping our bodies in, in the kind of shape that they may have one time been when we were young, we take care of our bodies so that we can continue to be used by the Lord, but we grow in the things of God. In the case of David, what David has done is he's simply growing older now, and as he's growing older, his body is no longer responding as it once used to. And so this, this, this giant sees that he's vulnerable, and he moves in to attack him, and, and what happens, according to verse 17 here in 2 Samuel 21, Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and, and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. Zer, um, Zeruiah was, was David's sister. This made Abishai his nephew, and so... David's nephew, a mighty man, a mighty man of valor, sees the giant and goes and attacks and destroys him. While David's mighty men see this taking place, his, his military men, and, and they immediately surround him and they say to David, we cannot afford to lose you. You're not coming out to battle with us anymore. David, it's time for you to no longer fight in the front lines. That must have been very difficult, but it was wise because they knew that their blessings came from God and that God was blessing David. So if an enemy had killed David, Israel would no longer be blessed. And so they say, we're not going to allow this. Well, in verse 18, it happened afterward that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. And then Sebekai, the Hushite, killed Saph, who was one of the sons of the giant. So this happened at Gob, which means that Sebekai was a gobstopper. <laughs> no, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I'm sorry. But <laughs> Gob was play near a place called Gezer. And there were a lot of old people there. And so, so this is just another one of those incidents where a giant was killed. Verse 19, 
There was war at Gob with the Philistines, where Elkanan, the son of Yari Oregim, the Bethlehemite, killed the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. So once again, we see another giant killed by one of David's men. And then finally, in verses 20 through 22, there was war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. His name was Raul, 24 in number. <laughs> he was also born to the giant. So when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, David's brother killed him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So all of these men had been defeated, which leads us to chapter 22. Now chapter 22 is a song of praise. In chapter 21 concluded with God's deliverance. Chapter 22 begins with praise. David was somebody who knew how to praise the Lord. He was somebody who wrote songs to God. When you, when you read the Psalms in the Old Testament, you have 150 Psalms. In the book of Psalms, 77 of those were written by David. David is referred to, we'll see this later in our study uh, next week, David is referred to as the sweet psalmist of Israel. So David was one who sang psalms unto the Lord, composed music to God, and he was one who was filled with praise. The Bible tells us in the New Testament book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 18, in everything give thanks. And David was one who gave thanks to God, and, and that's what we see. This is somebody who praised the Lord. He was blessed by God because God was his deliverer. He was blessed by God because God had done these things for him, and therefore he praises him. As it says in Psalm 109, verse 30, I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. Yes, I will praise him among the multitude. And David was one who praised the Lord. And he would compose songs to God. And that's what we see here in Psalm 20, uh, rather, 2 Samuel 22. 2 Samuel 22 is almost identical with Psalm 18. And so what you have here is a song of praise to God, a song that is composed out of one whose heart has been delivered. So beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4, David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge. My Savior, you saved me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord is my rock and my fortress. As he speaks, what he is saying is that God is various things in his life. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. He is my strength and shield. He is my horn of salvation, my stronghold. He is my refuge and my Savior. These are all what are called military metaphors because he's singing how God has protected him in times of war. And he loves the Lord. He loves the Lord because God has been faithful to deliver him throughout all of his struggles. He is his rock because God gives him stability. His fortress because he provides security. He is his deliverer because he provides relief. His strength because he provides endurance. He is a shield because he keeps the enemy's weapons from penetrating his life. He's the horn of salvation because he provides victory over the enemy. He is his stronghold, a stronghold the enemy cannot enter. He's his refuge because he provides security from attacks. And he's his savior because he delivers him. And this is how he sees God. These are the things that God is to David. And by the way, these are the things that God is to us. God does this on our behalf also. You need to under understand that and you need to take that home with you. That you can sing a song of deliverance also because God works in your life in the same kind of way. And that's why in verse 4 he says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. You see, when I'm under attack, I can call upon God because I know God will deliver me. You see that with the Apostle Paul. In 2 Timothy 4.18, Paul said, The Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. God will deliver me from every evil work. God will preserve me, and God will take me to be with him in heaven. That's the hope of the believer. David had that hope. David was able to say, this is the God that I worship, and I know him very well. 
God is a rock to me. He is a fortress to me. He is my deliverer and my strength. He is my shield, a horn of salvation, a stronghold, a refuge. God is my Savior, and I call on Him, and He answers me, and He delivers me. As he's speaking about this, I want you to notice, he goes on in verse 5 to say, When the waves of death surrounded me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple. My cry entered his ears. I was in distress. I was in a situation that was critical. Without God's help, I would surely have died. So what did I do? Well, verse 7 says, I, I called upon the Lord in this distress. Notice how he says, I called, I cried, but also, and he heard my voice. James 5.16 says, The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It's been said, prayers that are not felt are seldom heard. In the case of David, David cried out. And David said, I needed to be delivered. I needed to because I was being surrounded and I was afraid I was going to die. You know, that's actually sometimes not a bad place to be because when you are in that position, there's no one else to call to, is there? There's no one else to ask for help from. And so you call into God and you ask God to deliver you. In 2 Corinthians, in chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, Paul said it like this. He said, we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. In the past, God delivered me. In the present, God delivers me. In the future, he will deliver me. And that's how we as believers live. And the reason we do that is because we know our God is there to do that because he loves us. And so what do we do when we're in struggles? Some people take it into their own hands and they fail. Others are wise. They cry out to God. They call God. They say, God, I need your help. Like Bartimaeus, a man that we find in the Gospel of Luke chapter 18, a blind man there on the side of a road, and he hears the sound of what I call the Christian parade passing by. He asks what is going on. They say, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And as he hears that it's Jesus, it says in Luke 18, 38 and 39 that, that Bartimaeus cried out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. He wasn't about to be quiet. And when you're in a situation and you're in need, you're not going to be quiet either. And David said, I cried out, I called out to God. And as I did so, he heard me. In the case of Bartimaeus, as he was crying out to Jesus, Jesus stopped and the whole parade stopped with him. And Jesus said, bring him to me. And when Bartimaeus came to him, he threw away his cloak and everything that he relied on, ran to Jesus. And Jesus said, what would you have me to do? Lord, that I might receive my sight. And the Lord Jesus Christ healed him. He cried out. He wasn't about to be told that you shouldn't cry out to God. He cried out, and God answered. And that's what David's talking about here. He said, I was surrounded. I was in despair. I thought I was going to die. And, and I, in my distress, he said in verse 7, I called upon the Lord, cried out to my God. And the result was he heard my voice from his temple. My cry entered his ears. There's no call waiting with God. There's no leave a message with God. I call the Lord and he answers me. Well, going on, the earth shook and trembled. The foundation of heaven quaked. Foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils, devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew. He was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness canopies around him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning bolts, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. 
Nature in Scripture often is seen as a tool in the hand of God. That's because God is the God of nature. And God uses nature as he desires. And so David uses these illustrations to demonstrate the power of God and how God worked to deliver him. He goes on to say in verse 17, he sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me. They were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. I was closed in. I was overwhelmed. I was over my head. I was drowning. My enemies were surrounding me. But God was my support. God delivered me. And God took me out from that which was crushing me and put me into a place that was expansive. And he did this. And I want you to see this in verse 20. He did this. Why? Because he delivered me because he delighted in me. That word delighted carries the connotation of love. He did this because he loves me. If there's anything that we as believers need to come to a strong understanding of, it's that God loves us. You need to understand that today. There are many people who don't believe that God loves them, and so they get caught up in religious systems that make them work for salvation. Maybe if I work really hard, maybe if I do as much as I can, if I make great sacrifices, maybe I'll please the anger of God. And maybe God will not so much delight in me, but at least maybe he'll leave me alone. And there are people like that. There are people in systems like that. They try to work hard so that God may somehow accept them. But David knew better. David said, I know that my God delights in me. I know that my God loves me. There are two things that we need to know. One is that God loves us, and that two, God will forgive us. You need to know that today. If there's anything you walk out with today, please understand that. God loves you. Now, he may not like what you're doing. That's something you need to turn from if it's, if it's something he disapproves of, obviously. But God loves you. I've told my children, there's nothing you can do that will make me not love you. So stop trying so hard. No, there's nothing you can do that will make me stop loving you. And that's the truth. Why? Because I'm your father. And because a father's love is forever. And because I love you with all of my heart. It's nothing you can do ever that will make me as a father not love you. There are things that they do the way that I did things that a parent will disapprove of. They will do things that, that have caused me pain the way I caused pain to my mom and my dad. That is part of being a sinner. But the one thing that, that a child can rest in, at least my children can rest in, is that they're loved by their father. And the one thing that I can rest in as a believer is that I am loved by my father. My father God loved me so much that he gave his only begotten son. He gave Jesus Christ. He demonstrated his love toward me in that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And so if, if my God loves me, I can delight in his love because he delights in me. And that sets me free. When you understand that God loves you, the God of the universe that spoke all things into creation, that he loves you, that he has set his affection on you, that he desires only your good, transforms your life, transforms your life. It makes you into a new person. David knew the love of God, and David also knew the mercy of God. I want you to see something. Verse 21, the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me, and as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyes. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I remember a little hoochie named Bathsheba. I have a young lady in our fellowship. She's a doll. I love her. 
she and her at that time boyfriend who is now her husband went with us to Israel a few years ago and she uh, went to uh, uh, to get a tattoo well in Israel and so she had it placed on her shoulder Hebrew letters so she wanted to show me her tattoo so she walks up to me and says pastor David I got a tattoo I said really darling let me see it so she shows it to me and I said oh my she goes what I said do you know what they wrote on your back in Hebrew she says no I think you're supposed to say I said oh no honey I said I read Hebrew <laughs> I hardly read English but that says hoochie mama <laughs> she almost fainted she almost died it was so good <laughs> hoochie mama so I just got a, I just got an email from her husband and he was sharing with me where they're at and their desire to serve the Lord and they want to go to Haiti and and he says you remember us remember is my wife's the one you said is hoochie mama in Israel right <laughs> Well, she had one before her. Her name was Bathsheba. But this girl here was not a hoochie mama. Bathsheba. Not only did David commit adultery with and impregnate Bathsheba, but remember with me, David also made sure that her husband died. And yet, look what he's saying here. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. I have kept the ways of the Lord. I haven't done wickedly. I was blameless. I kept my... Now, what are you talking about, David? Well, I want you to see the last thing he says. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness. Now, notice, in his eyes. There's your key. David wrote Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. We've read it. We've studied it. There are psalms that relate to what happened with him and Bathsheba and, and all that, that followed that. He said that, that while he kept silent, that, that he dried up from within. He said, I was born, I was conceived in iniquity, I was born in sin, that's what I am. And he said, God, please do not take your spirit from me. Renew unto me a right heart. Work within me. And what happened is he said, the Lord heard my prayer. Now here's your key. One, God loves you, and two, God will forgive you to the point that you can say that God has looked at me with love and that I am walking a right way before God, the way David did. Why? Because he says, God is the one who worked according to my cleanness in his eyes. God is the one who made David acceptable because David repented. David said, God be merciful to me. That's the second thing you need to understand. Some people, when I minister to them, I see this so often, have failed to come to understand that God loves them and God will wash them 100% clean. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. That's what the Bible teaches. He says, behold, all things are become new. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin not from some sin but from all sin if we confess our sin he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and the problem I see with many saints today is they are trying to win their salvation through their own efforts even though they already cast themselves on the Lord and they're trying to be good for, for, for some sake of maybe to try and win some points with God or get some special blessing listen there's nothing you can do to make him love you anymore he loves you, and He washed away all of your sin, all of it, every single bit, past, present, and even future, all covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And what we do is we walk in that light. We walk in that knowledge, and it transforms you. I was a drug addict. I was a fornicator. I broke most of the Ten Commandments except for one. I never killed anybody. And yet, God, when He finally broke through and said, look it, it's not by works of righteousness which you have done, but according to my mercy, I'm saving you. You need me. When I came to that understanding, and it's taken a while, to be honest with you, for me to finally shed all those 
old ways of thinking like, oh, I've got to do something special. You know, God, no. God loves you, loves you, and God forgives you, and God makes you brand new so that without arrogance or pride, you can say, he delights in me, and I have righteousness. We have the righteousness of God. He made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God gives us his own righteousness. That way, when you stand before God, he sees you through the righteousness of his son, Jesus. The only way that you could enter in to the kingdom of God is through the standard of perfection, seeing that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How am I going to enter in? Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. It's the Lord who does the work. It's God who did the work in your behalf. We enter into his finished work. When Jesus was there on the cross, he said, it is finished. He didn't say, this is the beginning for you to try your hardest and be the best that you can be. He said, it's finished. And what you do is you look upon him and you say, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. And God, with his loving kindness, washes you by the blood of Jesus Christ and renews your spirit and makes you brand new. And you can say that God has made me what I am today because of the work of the Spirit within us. And so that's how he became capable of making that statement. He says in verse 26, with the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you'll show yourself blameless. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. With the devious, you'll show yourself shrewd. You will save the humble people, but the eyes, but your eyes are on the haughty or the proudful that you may bring them down. God shows grace to the humble, but God will oppose the proud. God sees the condition of your heart. He judges you accordingly. And so he's saying to us that the Lord will look within you and see that which is motivating you. He says in verse 29, you are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord shall enlighten my darkness. For by you, I can run against a troop. By my God, I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. I am not going to stumble in the dark because you provide light for me. I can see that wall and I can scale it in you. I'm given strength to be victorious against all my enemies, even at one time. And as I follow you, you lead me to victory. You protect me in my battles. It's like Paul said in Romans 8, 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? God is there fighting alongside of us. God is fighting our battles. I was about six years old. I was in school. And uh, the kids were playing kickball or something there on the, in the playground, and the ball came rolling to me, and some kids said, hey, give us the ball. And I took the ball and turned around and I kicked it in the opposite direction. So it got him mad for some reason. And he ran and he jumped on me. And he had me on the ground and he was trying to strangle me. I was six years old. And I'm laughing, like, oh, that was so funny. He was he's not happy. And I still remember this kid's face because he was so angry. I mean, his little face is all red. And I'm just cracking up. I'm thinking I did something very funny. And he didn't think so at all. But the funny thing that I remember about that is his face was so angry, but suddenly it stopped being so angry. And it got kind of, well, I had a look of pain in it. And I wasn't doing anything. I was just kind of laying there while he was trying to hurt me, laughing. And, and he's being pulled off. Well, I have an older brother named Frank who happened to be on the playground at the same time. And Frankie, my brother, had come up and grabbed the kid by the nape of the neck with his finger and thumb and was pinching him and pulled him off of me 
and the kids ah, and then pushed him and he ran away and left me alone I've never forgotten that because I have a God who does the same thing my God does that the enemy comes knocks me down and I'm going whoa and 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 Jesus says oh no you don't picks him up and throws him I really believe that I have a God who delivers me he doesn't let me get pounded like that he takes care of me and David is saying that saying God takes care of us God is able to be with us he works in our behalf and he ministers to us and cares in that way and delivers us and that's why I can trust in him God is perfect he works in my life and his ways are, are perfect and I can trust his word now in verse 32 who is God except the Lord there's only one God in other words who is a rock except our God God is my strength and power. He makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of deer and sets me on high places. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your gentleness has made me great. You enlarged my path under me so my feet did not slip. I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. I have destroyed them and wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet. You have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies so that I destroyed those who hated me. They looked, but there was none to save, even to the Lord. He didn't answer them. I beat them as fine as the dust of the earth. I trod them like dirt in the streets, and I spread them out. This is a warrior speaking, ladies. Ladies see this kind of talk and they say, well, wh wh why didn't David just sit down and visit with his friends and these enemies and why didn't he just kind of talk to them? Men think differently. They say, no, I'll, just, I'll put my, my foot on his neck and I busted him up. That's men. But I want you to see a couple things here. What gave him victory? And, and, and first, we can see it in two different ways and we'll look at it in that way. When he's speaking very practically, this is actually what took place when he was in combat, in physical warfare. God surrounded him, protected him, and he always walked away victorious in the Lord. God protected him. He took his enemies out and defeated them, even when they were crying for help. Because they were not with the Lord, God took care of David. And he says, I was protected by God. But secondly, you can see this as a spiritual application in the sense that we have enemies too. And the enemies that you have and I have, it's called sin. It's called sin. Sin is not something you deal with lightly. It's not something like a pet. You keep a, a particular sin. You get rid of all the rest, but you keep one or two that you really like, and, and you play with those sins once in a while. You get depressed, and so you go drink. You get upset about something, you go smoke some pot. You know, it's not that way. Sin isn't that way. Oh, my wife gets me upset, so I go look at some porn. You know, it's hidden. It's just one sin. It's one little sin. It's not going to do anything. To, no. Sin is dealt with brutally it is killed it is put to death you put your foot on it and you have victory over it that's how it's supposed to be that's what David is talking about he's saying my enemies are subdued under me well in a spiritual sense sin is subdued through Jesus Christ and by faith in him there are two things that you need to know one is he spoke concerning God's word his way is perfect the word of the Lord is proven and two he said God is my strength in verse 33 and my power so how am I going to overcome by the word of the Lord and the strength and power of God. By God's word and God's Holy Spirit. The problem people have today is they don't rely on either one. And because we don't rely on the word of God, we don't say, thus saith the Lord. And God, you have given to me abilities to do this. Jesus said that we would receive power after that the spirit of God was upon us. And, and, and yet we say, oh, I am, I'm, going to be, I'm going to be overcome by this. No, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can have victory. I can have it. I will have it. There's nothing that can overcome me if I stay strong in Jesus Christ. It's when I yield myself. It's when I get away from the Word. It's when I get away from brothers and sisters who can pray for me that I'm honest with, I can be real with, and say, you know what? Keep me in prayer. It's when I step away from the things that matter and when I'm isolated that the enemy has a tendency of attacking. But David said, look it. I've got God's word that is proven and I've got God's strength within me and I can overcome my enemies. And I believe, I believe the same thing because it's true. I can overcome in Jesus Christ. I can. And guess what? Even when I fail, I can be forgiven by Jesus Christ. I can be restored by Jesus Christ. I can be lifted up once again by Jesus Christ. 
even as David was lifted up even after he fell with Bathsheba and all that happened he could be raised back up because he called unto God even so I can too and so can you God is my strength and he gives me the ability to subdue my enemies and there's no combat regret involved here at all I did what I had to do and I did it and the Lord controlled me strengthened me and delivered me he says in verse 44 you have also delivered me from the striving of my people you've kept me as the head of the nations a people I have not known shall serve me foreigners submit to me as soon as they hear they obey me foreigners fade away they're fright and and come frightened from their hideouts and so he's saying here God is the one who has exalted me you delivered me you kept me as the head of the nations God has put me in this position I didn't have to try and take it for myself God gave it to me and God gives me the ability to rule prophetically there's one who is going to come that the foreigners are also going to be kneeling to and that of course is Messiah a relative coming from the line of Judah and finally he says the Lord lives blessed be my rock let God be exalted the rock of my salvation it is God who avenges me and subdues the peoples under me he delivers me from my enemies you also lift me up above those who rise against me you have delivered me from the violent man therefore I will give thanks to you O Lord among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name I am not ashamed to declare to the world what you have done for me I am open in my beliefs he is the tower of salvation to his king and shows mercy to his anointed to David and his descendants forevermore I have fought many battles but you have given me many victories and because of that I know that God your hand will be on me and not only me but notice verse 51 as we close not only me to David but also to my descendants the best thing that we can do as parents who love the Lord is do our very best to communicate that love to our children because not only can we be blessed but future generations can be blessed in him too I want to not only be blessed by God but I want my children my wife my children and my grandchildren to be blessed too psalmist says in Psalm 103 verse 17 the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children David was delivered and David praised God for it and God is the one who gave him victory gave him power gave him his word held him up and so naturally David would praise him.